glad to hear that uh, John Lennon seems to be the theme song for this in particular. And imagining is something we architects do a lot. In fact, one could claim that that's all we do. We imagine a building in all of its forms. We document it. And then we hand it to somebody else to build. And it's fully imagined, all contracts, all parts of the building are fully imagined. And when it's done, we look at it, and hopefully it is what we imagined. Um, so if we are to imagine a future proof, what would the world look like 250 million years from now, if we all still are around? That's a question that I think is very important. Because if we can go directly to that solution, then maybe we can kind of skip the rest of the carbon situation that we've stuck ourselves into, which is really what I'm going to be talking about today. So I, um, uh, I, I talked to a student uh, recently, and, uh, and I said, what's your generation about? And gave me an answer which I really wasn't very happy about. He said, well, swim to the middle of the river, watch out for the edges, keep your head down. And if things get bad, look at your phone. Well, <clears throat> that's not the way we're going to solve our problems. So, um, see that we have the old slideshow up here, but we'll go ahead with that. So in the old slideshow, I talk about the Industrial Revolution, how the windmill gives rise to the Industrial Revolution, because of course, the windmill has gears, and pumps, and so forth, and the dikes that uh, all of this water that is these windmills are pumping into dikes, all that civil engineering, gave rise to the mathematics that led to the Industrial Revolution. Um, architecture uh, is made up of uh, inventions and particular processes that, that, that begin to, to arise and, and, uh, and become part of our culture. And, and then architects use that to build the world. This is a, a terracotta uh, a piece by uh, Louis Sullivan, the father of the skyscraper. He also invented insulated glass. Uh, he was one of the great inventors of acoustics and, uh, and the air conditioning systems. Um, one of the people who worked in his office, a little known architect named Frank Lloyd Wright, um, he, uh, during the Depression, didn't have any work. So he wanted to invent a house for the common man. He worked on something called the Usonia House of Homes. Years later, uh, I was lucky enough to work for professors, Jonathan Levy Architects, and he took many of the ideas of the past, and he was very much an Americanist architect, and he used them in new technologies. At that point, the continuous press had come into play uh, for making plywood, and so we were able to make plywood in any length that we wanted. So we made these 40-foot long pieces of plywood. So this uh, building here and another building, the Gattaca House, are uh, super insulated homes. And, uh, and they have these giant 40-foot long pieces of plywood on them. And it was an amazing thing to work through the technology of, uh, of how to put together uh, these new systems and, uh, and be able to make window systems out of plywood and, uh, and door systems and so forth. It all fit together perfectly as we imagined it. Um, later on, because I had become involved in envelope design and so forth. I've skipped many, many years, but uh, I ended up working in plastic wood composites. And so plastic wood composites are actually uh, recycled plastics and recycled wood, often wood that is polluted with plastics, and then put into an extruder and extruded out of a machine and made into profiles, much like an aluminum profile. So um, the US Navy, um, contracted us, or actually gave us a grant, to uh, build the first plastic wood composite building in the world, which is the building in front of you there. 
Um, so we, uh, these are the extruders. And we extruded all of the siding ourselves with our students. It was a wonderful experience for everyone involved. We got to design the building. We built this very large building on, on the campus. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we went back a little bit to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, who was also quite interested in making what are called um, portal arch uh, plywood box beams. And so we framed the whole thing with these portal arches, which allowed us to make a parametric frame, a frame which will twist over, over the length of the building, which you can see somewhat in the drawings. And then these portal arches are then placed on plastic foundations, which we also extruded. So um, when we look at uh, our plastic bottles, and we think, oh, it's recyclable. But actually, this is virgin plastic. All plastic gets downcycled. So you have to find products like this wood plastic composite to be able to downcycle this into something else. So when next time you feel good about drinking one of these, think it's always virgin. Um, so getting into timber technology was quite interesting. And it sort of led to cardboard technology. And so we began to develop uh, ways of making building products out of paper. And so we made a kind of IKEA house created a paper frame and then cast that frame. We did a lot with uh, spinning machines, uh, making cardboard tubes and so forth, and adding various kinds of materials to reinforce the paper, because of course, paper is hydrogen bonded, which is really difficult to, uh, to work with, uh, because as soon as you add water to that, it melts. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to find some way to make it fireproof and make it waterproof and make it structurally sound. Uh, so that was quite difficult, but we developed some uh, plasticized uh, um, uh, emergency housing for the Red Cross, which was quite interesting. And, uh, and then later on, we uh, discovered a very interesting material called phosphate cement. Now, phosphate cements can be found inside of light bulbs, that little white bit that holds the bulb to the aluminum and so forth. It's also found in your teeth. Dentist use, often uses a phosphate filling to, uh, to, to, to put in your teeth. So here you have a cement that will stick to tooth, is as hard as tooth, and can be put on in very, very thin capacities. But what's really interesting about it is phosphates are actually fertilizers. And then the, what is mixed with it is magnesium. And the magnesium and the phosphate react together, an acid base combination, uh, and they end up with a, a, a neutral ceramic. So here you have a ceramic without having to fire it, which is fascinating. So we use that with the cardboard. And the cardboard then became a distance separator for uh, these highly structural cements. And that was a very interesting uh, area of investigation. And we did a lot of research into various kinds of three-dimensional uh, forms with this. Because what you really want to do is use the paper to create the shape and then spray it with the phosphate cements, and then you have a, a uh, very optimal structure, which is basically what cardboard does. It takes paper and folds it across the space, making an optimal, optimal structure. So if you can then reinforce that with other materials, then you're using a minimal amount of material for a maximum amount of structure, which is very interesting for architecture. But then we found that we could actually extract these phosphate cements out of wastewater treatment plants. Now, the problem with having phosphates in wastewater treatment plants is then when, when that water gets dumped into the river, we have algae blooms. And the algae blooms choke out the fish because it's a fertilizer going into a river. So if we can extract that, we can actually turn each wastewater treatment plant into a cement plant, which is a very interesting idea. We've also found that we can uh, also precipitate plastics. This is all done biologically, sort of like making cheese. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and we've actually found animals that, that uh, store poly polypropylene as a fat, and then you can harvest that and make a plastic, which is kind of a fascinating idea. Uh, the place that we can find most of these wastes and so forth is industrial waste streams, right? So particularly in farming, 
we can find these things. So when we think of phosphate cements, um, the phosphate cements are ultimately adobe, right? And the reason that we uh, have separate uh, digestive systems is that otherwise our digestive system would turn into concrete. So um, uh, when, you, when you add urine and feces together, you actually end up with a hardened surface. Um, now, the phosphate cements have been around for a very long time. Many of the Indian pagodas are done in phosphate cements, um, Angkor Wat, and so forth. So it's been around for centuries, uh, particularly using phosphate rock and, uh, and then any sort of metal oxide mixed with that. So in looking at industrial waste streams, we then began to look at uh, other sorts of industrial waste streams, larger things like shipping containers. and, uh, and Design, began to design. Uh, this is an artist housing complex there. And then here, this is a recent project. Uh, we've been working on vocational training schools for Africa and Haiti after the uh, earthquake in Haiti and, of course, the genocide in Rwanda. There was a need to uh, create new uh, large buildings in the area. And so we uh, began something called the Thrive Pods. And we take a shipping container. 40-foot shipping container, and most of the trusses in the United States that are in uh, the malls are 30-foot trusses, and there's a lot of dead malls now. What do we do with all these dead malls? I mean, you can't really, they're big box stores, and there's not much one can do with them, but they're very easy to take apart. And so we put 70 trusses inside of the shipping container, and some roofing, and uh, from a 400-square-foot box, we get a 7,000-square-foot building, which is kind of amazing. The last 10 feet of that container is full of tools that allows people to create cooperatives and an economic engine and begin immediately to uh, not only create an apprenticeship program, but to make money and prosper. So um, this is a photograph of, uh, of a house in Afghanistan, and it's beautifully decorated with uh, these nice round medallions made from bombs. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I curated a show with this wonderful uh, man, uh, Rafi Samize, and he is one of the few uh, architects that has actually taken on Afghanistan. He's built over 30 uh, buildings, schools, uh, town halls, um, and uh, courthouses and so forth in Afghanistan to really bring uh, peace and prosperity back to Afghanistan. Many of his buildings have been blown up, uh, so it's an ongoing battle. And um, he will get, uh, say, $2 million to build a building that was funded at 20 or $30 million. The rest go to California lawyers and then you know, whoever else is down the pipeline. It's really sad. Um, but uh, uh, curating this exhibition, it was very interesting to see how uh, resourceful people are. And here's a bridge. There are tanks on either side of this river, and the tanks are filled with rocks. And then the, the tank uh, carrying device, the trusses there, and that was a, an old trailer, is then made into a bridge. So there have been a lot of visions for architecture. This is Frank Lloyd Wright, this is Corbusier, these are visions of the future, and they very much include the highway. And um, this is uh, Ron Heron, a little more of a dystopian vision, uh, walking cities. But uh, I was uh, fortunate enough after working in the ceramic cements to sort of become a little bit known uh, for uh, these ecological materials and, um, and was given the task uh, by a group called the IT, uh, Green IT Alliance to um, uh, build a series of charging stations along the I-5 highway. Well, the I-5 is going to be the first electric highway, which will go from Canada to Mexico. And uh, so we developed a series of uh, charging stations. But as I began to think about the, the, uh, the problem of transport, um, it became very clear to me that uh, we needed to look at uh, a, a more substantial system. And, uh, and so what I'm going to talk about really here is the electric highway. Now, um, this is just to sort of place things within our kind of uh, what 
what, it, what this carbon century means. So as you can see here on this uh, bell curve, this is the Hubert bell curve, this very famous bell curve, this basic, this is, of course, there are many different ways to analyze this, but the bottom line is we're running out of gas. <laughs> Just, that's, that's it, we're, we're almost done. <laughs> and one of the problems is there is a certain amount of energy invested for energy retrieved. And so when you look at the blue part of that graph, you can see that is the part in which you have to invest energy to get energy out of the ground. And of course, we can see that in the fracking of our Earth and the deep well horizon and so forth. Obviously, we're scratching the end of the gas era. And uh, so we can see here on this map by about, you, you know, you can go all the way to the end of the century uh, with the blue part, but really, you know, the amount of gas that's actually going to be usable because it's going to be more and more difficult to get it out of the ground is there at about 2035. That's not good news. So that means if we want to maintain the way that we live, the way that we continue to uh, um, want to live, then we're going to have to come up with alternative energy sources. And so what I propose to you is that the new architecture, the, the truly futuristic vision, is to see how these facilities actually look and what this new system really looks like. And it's going to be a system in which we're going to have to invent as much as we've invented in the internet. This is going to be uh, really about inventing new ways of dealing with electricity, because electricity is going to be our savior. It's going to be the one thing that is going to get us through this. So um, I'm going to go a little bit back in history now and uh, talk about uh, uh, Thomas Edison. And he says this to uh, Henry Ford, Firestone. I put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. Here's the guy who invented the light bulb, but there was no electricity, so nobody could use it. Right? What's the use of a light bulb with no electricity? So he invented the generator, and then he took one square mile of lower Manhattan and actually paid for putting in electricity in that one square mile. Well, Manhattan's only five square miles, so you can imagine. And that was the beginning of all kinds of things. His company, Edison Electric, eventually became General Electric, which we know today. His competition, uh, of course, was with Tesla, with alternative energy, because Edison was actually But one of the engineers that worked for him, the young guy, Ford, was quite fascinated with racing cars and became very, very involved in the automobile. Edison was also involved with the automobile, and there was a competition, actually, between the two in which one would actually begin to uh, win out. And so, of course, we know the automobile uh, has a uh, 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 car, uh, petrol automobile one out. Um, but what's amazing is that uh, these electric cars were quite competitive early on. This is uh, Edison looking at his electric bus. This is his uh, version of the Model T in electric. And this is Baker. Baker's an interesting guy. He ran a uh, company which produced electric automobiles and trucks up until about 1919. And in this car, he broke the uh, world's land speed record by 60 miles an hour. He went 120 miles an hour in this electric car. And here we see a uh, electric uh, truck passing an electric trolley, both working off of. So we had a whole world which was actually wired with a streetcar for the longest time. And all of these streetcars created our suburban neighborhoods, right? It was, it, was, it was the streetcar that got you out to suburbia. In fact, when I went to high school outside of Pennsylvania, there was this wonderful streetcar. And you could get on it, you could be downtown Philadelphia in 25 minutes. It's wonderful. They've actually put it out of business now, but it's a 
wonderful thing. Well, um, in, from about the uh, 1930s to the 1950s, General Motors uh, very intentionally bought up all of the streetcar companies, over 100 streetcar companies in the United States, in the 50 largest cities in the United States, and intentionally put them out of business. They did that along with Mack Truck and Firestone. Of course, all of these were vested interests in creating tires and um, diesel buses and so forth. Um, well, they were found guilty and uh, of conspiracy and uh, fined $1,000. So, justice is done. And this is what we're left with. So, two trillion miles a year. How are we going to do that now if we're running out of gas? So what I suggest is that we go back to technologies that are known, but we improve them. So imagine driving down the road. Here's a four-lane highway, and you can pass the car on either side, you can see, and you just have electromagnetic antenna that pops up. You plug right in, you charge your batteries as you drive down the highway. When you get to town, you get off the highway, and you can use your batteries. Makes sense. Obviously, we're not going to be able to move a Mack truck with batteries. That's going to be very difficult. So we have to find other means of getting around. I got here this morning on a train, electrically. So many of these things are already in place. We know how to do them, but we're going to have to rebuild them, and we're going to have to put them into play, and we're going to have to reinvent them, because actually, Having trolley lines everywhere doesn't really make sense. I think this makes a lot more sense. If we just put a channel in the road, and that channel has a power to point contact, meaning energy management systems will allow you to uh, know where the car is and power that point. And then just a wand drops down from your car, and you drive along, and you can, again, charge your batteries as you as you drive down the highway. But then what? So, so what do we do? We get a bunch of oil and we make electricity. <laughs> no. <laughs> so what we have to do is we have to completely change the way that we create power. And power leads to prosperity, as we all know. So if we create distributed power, we can have distributed prosperity, which is also a rather interesting idea. Here in New Jersey, um, uh, there are requirements for having a certain amount of, uh, of uh, alter alternative energy uh, sources. And so they've decided to put photovoltaic cells on every telephone pole. Well, imagine driving down the highway on, in your electric car, being powered, and that there are a hundred or a thousand telephone poles, and they have windmills or they have photovoltaic cells on them. That becomes an independent grid. And then that independent grid is feeding your transportation. And so um, what needs to happen is that we need to begin to create energy management tools that allow us to uh, have super grids, which allow us to transfer large amounts of energy. We need a smart grid, and we need a distributed grid. So these are the three modes of invention that really need to now take place. So, we're at the very end here now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, uh, with my students, I uh, worked on uh, a, a number of different projects with them, and we just looked at various places in which we could gain power. And they then designed a series of architectural projects that began to show these things off. And uh, these are examples of them. Uh, so, wave technology. Uh, uh, anaerobic digesters. And then this is a very interesting idea, solar road, a road that actually absorbs energy made from glass. And this is now in, uh, being tested. Here are some of the examples. This is a, a digester. And this is really where the new architecture is going to take place. Um, so this is a 
kite system. There. And so we, I'm not saying we need to go back to this, but we need to reinvent it and think 